God, I pray you'd help me get out of the way so that you can be revealed. God, come saturate this place with your power. Lord, this city needs you, this nation needs you, the world needs you right now. Come as only you can do. We love you. We're so thankful for you. And all God's people shout it. Amen, amen, amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, you've got a beautiful smile and you smell pretty good too. Very cool. Whew. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn to the book of Acts and the 20th chapter. Verse 6, verse 7. When we were gathered together to break bread, this is Paul. He's on a journey. He's on many journeys. He has three significant journeys. And uh, he's on his way from Passover to Pentecost. It should tell you something about the context of this passage. This passage is very unfamiliar to many because it's sort of one of those weird sort of what's this got to do with anything? This is sort of humorous. It's a bit of an anomaly, but it's very significant. I want to sort of explore some angles of this passage with you today to stir your faith. Is that okay? Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. So he's been speaking from 6 p.m. to midnight. The NIV says he went on and he went on and he went on. Have you been under a preacher that went on and went on and went on? Is anyone married to someone that goes, oh, don't answer that question, don't answer that question. Paul is speaking a long time because he's only got one night with these people and he's got to tell them everything because he's never going to see these people ever again in his life. And the burden of delivering the message of the Gospel that they make sure that they know, they need to know what they need to know before he goes is priority for Paul. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered. It speaks of light in the darkness. It speaks of many things of, of the upper room, the place of the Spirit. When you see upper room, you should see the place of heaven, the place of the Spirit. That's what it alludes to. And a young man named Eutychus. Everyone say Eutychus. Please don't call your child Eutychus. Sorry if he already is. But <laughs> sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talks still longer and being overcome by sleep he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead at this point of the story it's not good we only laugh at this story because of verse 10 Paul went down and bent over him and taking him in his arms he says do not be alarmed for his life is in him I love that underline it highlight it do not be alarmed for his life is in him and when Paul had gone up and broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while. And he's still talking. Paul's still talking the next day. As a bit of, a bit of tucker, as we say in Australia, a bit of food, a bread and wine. And, and he keeps going. And he speaks till daybreak and he departed. And so they took the youth away and were not a little comforted. In other words, they were a lot comforted that this Eutychus had come back to life, restored into the upper room, joining the party as if sort of nothing ever happened. Interesting story. Let's explore it today. Thanks, bro. I love you, Evan. You're a man. Man of God. Amazing, man. Yeah. You see... I was reading about the most unluckiest, luckiest man in the world. You can take it either way. I just want to encourage you today by reading out a few things about a man named Frane Selak. He's Croatian. Have anyone know the story? He's quite famous. He died uh, in 2016. And some of his, his stories, you know, they're, they're debatable whether they're true or not. But let's just run with it because this is, this is church, okay? And we tell the truth here. So that's, you know. So this is, this is what happened to him. If you think you're having a bad day, think, think about this guy. Uh, he, he was born, um, his first brush of death was in 1957 when a bus he was on swerved off the road and into a river. Both Selleck and the bus driver managed to get out of the bus and they were swam to shore. Selleck later stated that the 
The driver never got behind the wheel without half a bottle uh, of, of alcohol in his system. Wow. Disaster struck again in 1962 on a train. A boulder fell on the tracks, causing the train to jump off the rails and crash into the icy river. He managed to break the window free and uh, save the life of somebody else travelling with him. Gets better. 1963, he got into a charter flight from Zagreb to Raika to visit his mum who'd fallen ill. The flight was fully booked and uh, it says he was sitting in the rear of the plane and uh, the plane door was blown off from the crash, sucked him out of the aeroplane at a height of 800 metres. Despite all the odds, he landed in a haystack and lived. This man is blessed. (laughs) Gets better. 1973, he was on another car ride, it went awry. Uh, while Salok was driving, a malfunctioning fuel pump leaked hot oil into the engine, resulting in a flames which shut up through the air vents. While most of his hair was singed, Salok did not sustain any other injuries. This is a true story. 1995, he was hit by a bus. Again, no serious injuries. A year later, in a UN truck, almost crashed into his car on a mountain road. He avoided the collision by swerving at the very last moment and crashed into a guardrail. The fence gave way and his car fell into the ravine some 100 metres below. So, however, wasn't wearing a seatbelt because ever since he got sucked out of a plane, he thought, what's the, what's the point of a seatbelt? So he just... <laughs> don't blame him. You know, but these last disasters, a few days after he turned 73, he won the lottery, 6.5 million uh, runa, which is a million dollars. He bought, a ho- he bought a house, a holiday home, generously shared the rest of his, uh, his winnings with family and friends. He reportedly bought and gifted 25 cars to people and lent money to a whole bunch of people, then died in 2016. What an amazing story. I hope it's true. I think it's true. I did thorough research and many sources, but uh, he's, on, he's been on TV and he's told the story uh, many, many times. But, you know, th- th- this could be unlucky or, or, or lucky. But, but I want to I point to something today and the title of my sermon is called The Fortunate Ones. The Fortunate Ones. Do you know that you are fortunate today? You know, when you associate words, sometimes you think of like fortune tellers and, you know, you got sort of lucky. But I want to sort of dive deep into this word, uh, fortunate today. I believe this story has been taken from many angles over the years. And I want to present a few to you today. You see, most people sort of blame Paul for the long, boring preaching. And there's a lot of boring sermons out there and a lot of boring preachers. But I want to tell you today that Jesus ain't boring. Jesus is not boring. The problem is the people who are delivering Jesus or the Jesus they're presenting seems boring. Jesus is radical. Jesus is the most adventurous, animated, compassionate, full of zeal, wisdom, kind man you'll ever meet. He's the Son of God. This just doesn't even compare to anybody. Jesus is radical. You know, I believe that this generation, people are, what's the success to the belonging? Why are people coming? Oh, you've got a great worship team, music. You know, no, 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 no. You know why? You know why I think, and God's giving me verbiage to this, we have lost mystery. But this church and what we present here is presenting the mystery of the gospel. What I mean is that's not hidden and exclusive. I mean there's wonder. There's something that's not being, you know, there's an adventure about a life in Christ and a life in the Spirit that needs to be explored. That isn't, oh, here we go, same old, I can I know what's going to happen now. Yep, clock's going to tick over. Yep, worship's finished. Yep, yep, this is going to happen. Preacher's going to do this and this, you know, we'll get three points and then we're out of here. You see, that's boring. I would rather go and watch a Titans football match. (laughs) If I'm going to be a Christian, I want adventure. I want to follow this Jesus who is radical. He said, hey, drop your nets, boys. Come follow me. Let's go and have some fun and save the world. Don't blame Paul. He's got one night. You'd be telling him everything you knew as well. But Christians, they're asleep today. They're slumbering. They're not aware of the world, they're not aware of the word of God and what they're part of and the narrative that, that, is, that is moving right now by his spirit. We are seeing the scriptures unfold before our eyes. Do you realize that? We are seeing prophetic words in scripture hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years ago being, being, being played out right now. 
You know, Paul could have been teaching about Ezekiel 37, 38. It says, one day there's going to come this war of Gog, Gog of Magog. He's like, Gog of Magog? You'll find it. Go and read it for yourself. You know, this whole Armageddon thing where, where nations will conspire. People are saying, is this the time right now? I've got Ukraine and Russia, you know, fighting. Is, is this the last days? Is this Armageddon right now? Well, I don't believe so because there's got to be a few things that happen before that, but, but it's moving towards something that we've never seen before. What's going to happen, you can trace these nations, uh, but like Persia and Put and Goma uh, mentioned in the Bible, which descend from the tribes of Noah in Genesis 10. And these, these old tribes have modern names like Iran and Turkey and Russia and places that are directly north. As the Scripture says, there will come attack from the north and allegiance from the north when these nations start forming together straight above Israel, which, by the way, Israel is the time clock of the world. God's in control, but you need to watch what happens in Israel. You see, it's, it's interesting, sort of Israel has a bit of a peace treaty with Russia at the moment. So this is not Armageddon right now. You know, there's been many wars throughout history. But you see, when these nations of the north start forming allegiance and alliances together and they go after Israel, then you can be assured perhaps this is Armageddon or after the millennial reign, a thousand years, there's another one as well that Revelation 20 talks about. I'm not going to go into all the details about that today. But you see, Things are happening in Scripture before our eyes. They're converging. These, these partnerships and alliances are starting to take place. You see, there has to be total peace in the land of Israel before, uh, before these things take place and Christ comes back. There's not total peace, but since 1948, Israel has been declared a, a sovereign state. Do you know that 3.3 million Jews have made Aliyah, which has migrated back to their land since 1948? Since, the, since even going back, the exile of Babylon, where they have been dispersed, the diaspora have been dispersed across all the world. 31% increase last year of Jews returning to Israel. This is the Word of God. Whew, I'm getting chills. When that starts to happen, okay, when people will make Aliyah, make their way back to Israel uh, of, of Jewish descent, then, then you can start to see, wow, this is, this is the prophetic Word of God being played out. You can show someone these things in Scripture. They've got no idea. You don't have to know them in detail. But friend, you're not just a Christian in Nashville in a building, you know, in America. And I've got nothing to do with the rest of the world, friends. We sometimes can live in our own little bubbles. I want to wake your eyes and your heart up today to say that you are part of something living and active and moving much bigger than yourselves. Don't let the cares and the concerns of your world and your family and all that sort of stuff and jobs distract you from the mission. Paul is focused. So much so that the miracles are almost a bit of a side dish because they just go back up and eat and keep talking. I couldn't concentrate after that. Someone's just been raised from the dead. I'd be looking at Eutychus and I'd be not listening to Paul. You see, he's focused. I've got to get to Jerusalem. I've got to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. Uh, there's more people to tell. I've got one more journey to Rome after that. I've got to fulfil my mission. I'm going to stay focused. I'm going to stay alert. I'm going to watch. I'm going to pray. I'm going to be ready. And it's almost like signs and wonders follow the accompany of the preaching of the Word of God. You see, for the Jewish reader, they understand that this is a confirmation, an affirmation of Paul's authority as an apostle, as his Jew, a Jewish apostle, that he performs this miracle just as Peter did in Acts chapter 9, a few chapters earlier, where he too went into an upper room and he prayed for a woman named Tabitha, also named Dorcas. And she too, in the upper room, came back to life and went about her business. 
You see, it happened with Paul. It happened with Peter. It originally happened with Jesus Christ, who's raised on Lazarus and Jairus' daughter from the dead. These happen in upper rooms. But if you want to go further back, you can look at Elijah. You can look at Elisha, where Elijah stretched himself over the widow's son, a boy. And what happened? He came back to life. There is life back then, there is life today and there is life for your future, church. This resurrection power is at the sense of a good exegesis on this passage. It's the affirmation that the same God of Paul is the same God of Elijah. Its resurrection power lives today. But it warrants some allegorical license. This passage, it needs it. It is it, it, so much to it. You see, my, my, my question is, what's a young boy doing sitting not near the window, not just by the window? What's he doing sitting on the window? Where's his mum and dad? <laughs> no, that's my question. If my daughter is hanging out the window of a car, I'm going to pull them back in. If someone's on the edge, a precipice of a cliff, you're going to pull them back in. If someone sees something that's a little unsafe, you know, helicopter parents, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. You know, it's amazing. You say, I won't be one of those parents. And you're like, sweetie, don't do this. Don't. And you're like, let it, let it go, let it go, trust me. You know, when you first have that child, that first child, and you, you're waking up every hour just to see if they're breathing, you know, like... And they, they, they stop breathing for like 15 seconds. It's like natural or something. And then they let this, you know, just let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. That, that song goes over in my house and over and over and over again. My brother bought me a karaoke machine and sent it, you know, from Australia. He and I rocked up in our door and the kids have got these microphones and they are so loud and you cannot turn the thing down. It's one level and it's loud. And all our neighbourhoods say, let it go, let it go. It's a beautiful thing. But where's mum and dad? Where's the fathers and mothers saying, hey, get off the windowsill. You're a little close. It's a little risky. Teenagers, you know, I'm so glad I had somebody say, hey, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be dating that girl. You know, is that the best decision for you? You know, one foot in the world, one foot in church. You know, we, most of us have been there a little bit. I tell you, God can't use that person. You're not sold out to either or the other. You're lukewarm. God's saying, get off the windowsill, get in the middle with a place of my spirit where you can be used, where you won't fall asleep, where you're not at risk of death. I used to go clubbing, I used to be in the clubs. Anyone used to go to the clubs or discos? Anyone remember? It's called discos where I, yeah, let's go to the disco. You know, it's like. I want to be honest, man. I, I got into nightclubs underage. I had fake IDs. I was that dude. I was like, you know, but I was doing that Saturday night. Sunday morning, I'd be playing drums in church. Oh, man. I remember playing Celebrate Jesus Celebrate and they put me on drums for the first time and I couldn't keep up with the pace. And, and you've got to use your wrist as a drum and I used my whole arm. I got lactic acid in my arm and the song started at and it sort of got to and it was slower and slower until it nearly stopped and the whole church was looking at me. I threw my drumsticks. I said, I'm never going to do that again. I said, boy, get back up there. Get back on the horse. What was I talking about? Clubs, I was in the clubs. <laughs> Stay out of the clubs, nothing good ever happened in the clubs. Tell me, I go to the clubs to witness. Yeah, right, you go to witness. One eye on the creator, one eye on the creation. <laughs> Stop it, don't make me go there. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's just lukewarm. It, it, it's lukewarm. Thank God he, he had mercy. He didn't strike me down with lightning. You know, like, but, but we, 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 it might not be the clubs for you, but it might be your, 
your business for you. It, it, it might be even your, your family or the things of the world. You know, the, the love of the world is, is corrupting this move of God and it's causing us to be sleepy and, and slumber. You know, we, we need fathers and mothers and, and sons and brothers and sisters to say, hey, wake up, get out of your slumber. Where's your fire? Where's your zeal? You used to love Jesus. You used to tell people about Jesus. You used to go to church. You used to be the church. You used to go to Bible studies. You used to go to co-groups. You used to be around people. Now you're sitting in the back. You're this loner. Come on, where's the people who say, get back into the community of God. We have a major crisis on our hand. You know what that crisis is around the world? People have orphan spirits. Orphans everywhere. Not knowing their father. That's what an orphan is. Not knowing their identity. That's the biggest crisis. So we've got a political crisis. We've got a, you know, economic crisis. Uh, you know, the biggest, the biggest crisis. You know, we've got a sin crisis. But even preceding the sin crisis is we've got an orphan crisis. Because if orphans knew who their father was, they wouldn't have so much of a sin crisis. Do you know in America, there are 19 million families without fathers? One in four families doesn't have a dad. It's the fabric of God's heart to have, you know, and you might be in this place and experience that yourself and you know what it is to, to fight. You know what it is to hustle. You know what it is to feel that sense of, of void. It's, it's stated that if you don't have a dad, you're four times greater risk of poverty, seven times more likely to become pregnant as a teen, more likely, this is from a US Census in, in 2021, are more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol and go to prison and commit crime, two times more likely to drop out of school. We have a father and mother issue. Saying, hey man, get off the window. Get off the window. You know, you don't have to be a mother and father to be a spiritual mother and father. That last passage in Malachi where the, the hearts of the fathers will be torn to the turn of the children, the children's hearts to the fathers. This is, this is what Jesus Christ was able to do as He died on the cross for us. The Spirit be poured out and the love and the forgiveness and the mercy and the grace that, that fathers and mothers could know to be restored to their children. This, this is the question. Why is this kid by himself? I mean, the parents might have been there, could be reading into a little more, but it doesn't say anything about them. Some people, you know, there might be teenagers here today. You're here, but mum and dad aren't. You're leading the family. Can I say, don't give up. Be a witness, be an example. Stand strong in your faith. Honour your mother and father. If they say you can't do something, you honour that. That's okay, you can still have your relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't fight them. Stand strong. Mum and dad will come to church. Mum and dad will be the church. Mum and dad will be saved. You see, we have alienation through the fall. There is an agenda of the enemy to separate us from the place of love, from the place of the Word, from the upper chamber of the Spirit. That's the enemy's, that's the enemy's plan. It's always his plan. He, it's his plan for you to wrestle with your identity. That you'd find it in doing things and having things, you know, and then I can become something. No, 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 no. God says you are made in the image of God. You are made in my image. The question of, of Satan to, to the Eve is, is uh, you can be like God. And I always say, well, when, did you, when were you not like God? The lie, the subtle deception is that you are like God from the beginning and you can't work for it. You can't add anything to it. You can't, you know, wrestle for that. You never see that, that you are a child, a son, a daughter of God. Someone listening in prison is going to hear this message and that's for you right now. Just receive it. You don't have to earn it. You have not had a good model as a father, but receive the Father's love wherever you are watching right now in Colombia. Receive that right now. Now, in the name of Jesus. Is it Paul's fault? Maybe a little bit. Is it the father's, parents' fault? The community's fault? Maybe a little bit. But that's not what the word sort of goes at here. The boy must sort of take responsibility for himself a little bit. 
I mean, he's sitting on the window. He's had a hard day's work. He's probably hungry. He's tired. You know, you get the head nods. You the head nods. You're, like, you're just so, you know, and you just wake yourself up, you know. Uh, you know, thankfully no one's fallen off the chair during one of my sermons yet, you know, but, 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 but you know, I've got a trick for you. You know, if you're feeling a little sleepy with the kids, you know, we try to keep them awake before their nap times in the car. Sometimes the car ride goes a long way and you're in traffic and you're like five, ten minutes from home and you're like, don't fall asleep, sweetie, don't fall asleep. And you're doing everything. You're turning up the music, you're singing songs and they're, uh, and they're doing these songs and they're, food all over me, you know. It's like, hang on. And you feel so bad. Just let them sleep. Just let them sleep. Well, I found the key to waking them up. You know what you do? You wind down all the windows and you go a little faster and a bit of fresh air. <laughs> Two-year-old's like. <laughs> Some of you need a bit of fresh air. Some of you need the wind of the Spirit to... <laughs> Some of you need to slap them sideways. Some of you need an encounter to wake you up. Some of you are in a spiritual slumber. It says it is overwhelmed by deep sleep. It's a metaphor for death. I ain't got time to go through, but you look where sleep is, you'll often find it's figurative for, it's, it's figurative for death. It's, it's metaphorical for death. It's, it's a picture of the disciples in the garden not tarrying and falling asleep time after time. And someone who was in his deep sleep was often dead. But, but this guy, Eutychus, he, he's dead. Why? Because Luke, who wrote Acts, is a physician. And he knows if someone's dead or not. He knows if someone's out to it or not. This guy has fallen from three stories down to his death in the middle of Paul's sermon. But some of us preachers would be too proud to keep going because we're more, we're more concerned about people getting our message than, than, than a demonstration of the power of God. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That statement has proved me, served me well throughout my life. Don't tell me, don't preach to me, don't sing to me, don't lecture me, don't sermonise me if I don't feel your heart, if I don't feel a connection, if I don't feel your love and care for me. Because I tell you, I was a teacher and students and if students knew that you cared for them, you could teach them anything. You can love them, it's with your own children. You know, if they feel that love when they've messed up, and they know that they're going to be forgiven and we get up and we go again, you know, you can tell them anything. We have a rule in our house. There's no secrets, only surprises. No secrets. We don't keep secrets. You know, we, we just tell, we tell surprises, you know, because we want our children to be able to come to us with anything at any time and not hide and not hide the shame or the guilt or the sin and be able to say, hey, Daddy forgives you, Mummy forgives you. Will you forgive us? <clears throat> Excuse me, at times... And, and, and most of all, Jesus forgives you. Because most, most of us withdraw to the windowsill, to the edge of the community, because we, don't, we feel our shame and our guilt and we're too scared to get in the middle because we've done a whole bunch of stuff and we don't want people to know or find out who we're really like. You see, we're on, we're on the edge today. If you're on the edge today, you know, if you're in the edge of the seats, that's okay. You know, it's full house. I'm not having a go at you, but, but be in the middle today, in the will of God's will, in the centre of His will. You see, I've got a point to say to you today that Eutychus, Eutychus didn't fall from grace. Eutychus fell into grace. The church has preached, well, you had a fall and did this and this. Did you hear what Susie did? And they fell from grace. Come on. That is naive. That is a silly statement in the nature of God. When Galatians 4, 6, I think it is, Paul talks about falling from grace. He's talking about justifying your salvation through your works. Nothing to do with sin or something that you did and getting so far away from God that you fell from heaven and fell from His grace. David said, where can I run to? Where can I hide that you are? He's saying, come, come back in. Come back into my love and to my grace. Someone needs to know that today. The message for me is summed up in the meaning of Eutychus' name. His name means Fortunate. Fortunate. This 
is a fortunate story. But Eutychus is all of us. He's a slave, he's young. In Hebrew, his actual word means senseless. He's senseless, but he's also known the fortune of God. He's, he's been on the edge. He's been in the place uh, of slippery slope, if you like. He, he's symbolic of, of, of the fallen man. This is much more than one individual here. Eutychus is the fortunate one. You see, we judge fortune by, by the things we have or the places we go to, or the people we rub shoulders with, or the relationships, or the material possessions, or the status, or how far we get in this life, or the education that we have. But friend, we need to wake up to to what God calls fortunate. The Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, talks about a whole bunch of things that says, blessed is He, blessed is He. That word can be translated in some translations, fortunate is He. In other words, the, the, the definition of fortunate here is implies that success is obtained by the operation of favourable circumstances more than the direct effort. In other words, what you got out of it was a whole lot more than what you put into it. It's called grace. You are the recipient of grace. The fortunate ones. I love that. We are the fortunate ones. I want to copyright that hashtag t-shirt. The fortunate ones. Someone write a song called The Fortunate Ones. We are the blessed ones. Why? Let's look at the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. Evan, you can come. It says, He opened His mouth and taught them saying, and you can translate, uh, you you can put the word fortunate in here. Fortunate are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You want to know if you're blessed today? You want to know if you're a fortunate one? You are poor in spirit. That that means that that you're humble. You carry humility. Nothing to do with possessions or or money. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. You don't want to know if you're fortunate. You mourn and you know the comfort of Jesus Christ by the power of His Holy Spirit. That's fortunate. That is fortunate. Because if you've lost someone close to you and you've grieved and you know what death is, Friend, you are fortunate because you can be comforted when you mourn. There are many people out there that are not comforted in their mourning. They don't know what it is to have comfort. They don't know what it is to grieve with hope. That's what Jesus says is fortunate. Fortunate are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth that is strength under control. That is those who don't have to go broadcasting who they are or power, you know, wrestles and and positions of society, but the meek are the fortunate ones. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied. If you love righteous, if you're in right standing with God, you're fortunate today. Blessed, fortunate are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. The first four there are attitudes. The second four are like fruits of the attitude, if you like. Blessed are the pure in heart, or fortunate are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Fortunate are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Fortunate are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Eutychus is fortunate because on that day, grace reached out its hand from heaven. And grace wrapped its arms around him. And grace poured out its heart and its mercy to say, Eutychus, you're not just a slave, you're not just a young boy overlooked. You're not just a senseless, immature, did some unwise things. Eutychus, you are my son. And here is my grace. And here is an encounter with the living God of resurrection power. You know, if you look at the Greek word of Paul throwing his arms around Eutychus, picking him up and grabbing him, that Greek word epipesson is the same word used for the prodigal son, the father wrapping his arms around him. (laughs) This is another type of prodigal story. Not maybe of deliberate action, but maybe of accidents. 
God's got the whole gamut covered. Deliberate, unintentional, unforeseen, unfortunate, accidental. Why did this happen? I know why this happened. God says, my grace extends the whole gamut. You are fortunate if the Kingdom of Heaven belongs to you. (laughs) That is liberating. That makes me want to do a Pentecostal two-step. You mean if tomorrow doesn't work out the way that I thought, or I find myself back in Australia for a little time, or my plans, you know, personally, oh, this this didn't happen like my, my future, I thought it would, I didn't get that job, or oh, my, my spouse walked out on me that, that I'm unfortunate, I'm not blessed. No, 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 no. Stop measuring your success by the things of the world. You're fortunate because of those things I just read out. You're fortunate because the Kingdom of Heaven belongs to you. We're going to get to Heaven and go, oh, that didn't matter, that didn't matter, that didn't matter. God set His his criteria for blessed people is so different. So different. But yet we're fighting for all these things in in the times we live in. You know, we, we get so down and exhausted and frustrated because we're dealing with a different set of criteria. What if we just meditated upon Matthew 5 for a few days? Begin to allow the Holy Spirit just to pour out over us and be grateful and thankful that we can be this type of person. You see the list a whole type of things, but it really speaks of the one person that carries the one Spirit. Blessed, fortunate. You're fortunate today. You are the fortunate ones. You're the fortunate ones because God sent His Son to come to this earth, to come down from the third story, come down from the third heaven. And you all know that number three means resurrection. So it just fits perfectly in the story. You see, God is the God of number threes. He's the God of resurrection. He comes down. It says He stoops down. Jesus stoops down to mankind and He says, I'm going to lavish my grace and I'm going to lavish my mercy. And it's undeserved. I don't care what you did, whether you meant it, whether you didn't. I tell you, there's an encounter for resurrection power because I'm the God that brings death things to life. I'm the God who wakes up sleepy people who are in spiritual slumbers, naive, ignorant, arrogant, rebellious, whatever it is. I'm the God who extends my mercy. Uh, mer- blessed are the mercy, fortunate are the merciful. They shall receive mercy. Friend, are you showing mercy today? Yeah, because, because to be blessed is to show mercy, to receive mercy, just as God gave mercy to us. It'll keep your relationship alive with God. It'll keep it fresh. It'll keep it living. It'll keep it, it'll keep it spontaneous. It'll keep the life in love. You'll be living on love and not on religion. It's time to just start living on love, living on truth and not religion. Not on ticking off some box to come to church and do your duties. But friend, come on, there are people, there are people out there. There are Eutychuses out there that need you to come down. Stop what you're doing. Stop what you're saying. Get down to their level. Get down to the third floor. Pray for them, be with them, love with them. And saying, hey, don't be alarmed, friend. It's all good. I know this Jesus. Don't go lay on them, by the way. That could get you in prison. But just say, do not be alarmed. Your life is still in you. Your life is still in your marriage. Somebody needs to hear that today. Your life is still in your friendships that have been dispersed. Your life is still in your business. Your life is still in the son and daughter who are away from God. Your life is still in the situation. Do not be alarmed. If you're gonna give a praise to God, give a good praise to God. And let's all give Him one shout of praise today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, stop slumbering, friends. There's so many Eutychuses out there that don't even know they fell off a window. 
They've got no idea they're even dead to sin, dead in sin. They've got no idea of what's going on around them. What this says, the Word of God says, you are the only Jesus they'll meet. You have been so fortunate. I have been so fortunate. It is such a disservice to the heart of God to keep it to yourself because we're worried about a little bit of rejection or what will look like or embarrassment or whatever the issue is. Friend, let someone else be fortunate. Let someone else see the blessing and the fortune of God, what it is to be well off in Christ. Riches of eternity, riches in Christ right now. Someone needs to share the Gospel. Friend, it's time that we double this church, triple this church, triple the body of Christ. It's time that we get out of our little jobs and comfort zones and we, and we, and we start seeing the things around us. The people that are on the window ledge, the people that have fallen off the window ledge, the people that are starting to go to sleep. You know, you know there's one animal, there's one animal that doesn't have eyelids. There's one animal that doesn't sleep. Well, at least it sleeps in a weird way. Every other, most animal has eyelids and they sleep. Even cows, cows sleep, standing up. Do you know what the animal that doesn't sleep, doesn't have eyelids? It's a snake. It sleeps, they say, with one eye open. It has these scales in its eyes that allows half of its brain to sleep at one time, but keeps the other eye open for attack. <laughs> it's, it's an incredible picture of how the enemy tries to prowl around like a lion, you know, looking for those he can devour. He's just got one eye open, you know, I'll just take a, I'll look, I'll take a little rest. Ooh, I feel the Spirit of God right now. I'll take, I'll take a little rest right now, but I've got one eye open, just, just, just ready to attack because but Sister Susie over there or Brother Johnny over there, looks like he's just getting a little apathetic. Looks like he's lost a little bit of the fire. You know, I'm not gonna slap him with one big accident or trauma in his life. I'm just gonna lull him into sleep, lull him into sleep. So Slowly but surely, and before you know it, you fall out of the window. Because you stop staying connected to the body of Christ, or you stop going to church as a part of it. You stop being part of co groups and sharing the love of Jesus or talking about it. Your prayer life just slowly went to sleep. Friends, this is not condemnation. This is just an encouragement to wake up. Me too. Because it's easy just to go, life, life. But we must take example of Paul here. Straight back up into the upper room. Let's break bread together. Pass over, death shall pass over you. Death shall part, death passed over you because death passed over that house today. Come on, we're celebrating Pentecost. I've got to get to Pentecost. We're going to celebrate the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I'm going to die soon. I've got one chance. Come on, Paul's just so focused, so focused. The healing, the sign, it's just a side dish, like I said. God has much for us to do, friends, but we need to keep laser focus out of our slumber. Beware of the snake. And keep your eye on the shepherd, amen. Let me stand to your feet in this place. Band can come. Romans 8, 11 says, The Spirit of Him raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Who dwells in you. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. Friend, somebody needs to get in the path of Jesus Christ today. Somebody has worked out, you've worked out your life to a T. When are you gonna do this? At what age, at what season, and where are you gonna be when you're gonna, I tell you, there's a way that seems, there's nothing wrong with some of that stuff, but there's a way that seems right in our heart, but it leads to death because there's only one way that leads to life and that is Jesus Christ. You are a fortunate one if you know Him. You are blessed if you know Him. You are, you are so blessed. We are so fortunate. 
We don't live in fear of our house being bombed up and all these things right now. We know that we have peace that passes all understanding despite what happens to us. Do you know that angels long to look upon us at the mysteries that we know about Jesus? 1 Peter 1.12, I believe, says that. They look in awe. Wow. Look at those Christians. Look at those believers. They know Christ. They get to know Him personally. They get to have His Spirit dwell in Him. You know, when you get to heaven, you, you, you know, I picture, I've said this before, you, you get to interview Moses or Abraham, and, you know, and you'd be like, oh, Moses, what's it like to part the Red Sea? Well, what's it like to, to see a burning bush in the desert? You know, what's it like to, to, to see armies slayed and the power of God? They'll say, oh, it was amazing. But then they're going to turn around and say to you, what was it like to have the Spirit of God dwell in you permanently? Just a Christian. All I want to do today is upon the things of your heart. That the Spirit of God just defy it. The fire is there in each of us. Some of it is, is dwindling out. Just put another log on the fire. Not by works, but by the grace of God. Let Him put the log on the fire. That's a better theology. But, but, but fan into flame the gifts. Just lift your hands to Him. Yeah. Some of you have been dry. Some of you need an encounter today. Some of you are sleepy. Some of you are just exhausted. Eutychus is exhausted. We get like that. That's okay. No one's blaming anyone in this story. It's all about the resurrection power. It's all about life. It's all about grace. Just receive today as we sing. I need a fresh touch. I need the anointing. I need manna from heaven.